Hello. Hey, Yael. Hey, hi, Mary. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. Hold on. I'm just finding a spot. And welcome to our uh, viewers as well. What? Oh. We just rearranged our home oh. to be our teach from home, work from home friendly. But I'm getting confused where I'm supposed to go. <laughs> Um, oh wow! So your kids are at home in Chicago. Um, they're uh, no, Hody's in school, but you know it's like who knows how long it will last. So right. It was great to see you, and we have uh, we have some nice people online with us. Hello, everybody. Hello, Nelson. Hello, David. Hello, Dory. Hello, Chabad. Whatever that is. Um. Okay, we'll give you folks another minute or two to join on, but we will be beginning in just a moment. And let me. All right, uh, Ravari, is there a reason I can only see you? Yes, because this okay. is a panel. This is cool. a webinar. Okay. Um, if it's a sometimes we do this, uh, it's a little more streamlined. But what we can do is, if if folks want to join on, we can promote people to panelists, and then you can see everybody. Would you prefer that? Um, it's your call. I'm Why not? I think we'll be a. Uh, we won't be a lot. Sometimes we do this for larger groups, and it's easier to record it. But I'm going to make everyone a panelist so everyone can join on. Just that way, if I can, you know, if people want to show their faces, it's. Uh, That's right. It's nice to get to know people. So uh, everybody who's online, you should be promoted as a panelist now and hold on one moment um i've always wanted to be a panelist so this is my <laughs> first time uh i feel like I'm, I'm on to tell the truth or uh something like that basically all right i'm making you l yeah maybe you should mute people like me here i'll mute <laughs> And yes, we'll put everybody on mute. And now we should, do we see everybody? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Can I ask uh, where is the speaker located? Are you in New York? Or are you, where in the world is the speaker? I live in Philadelphia. <laughs> All right, so um, I think we'll get started. Uh, we are really fortunate to have with us today and with us, God willing, this year, certainly virtually and please God in person, uh, uh, intern from Yeshivat Maharat, really um, someone who I've known for a long time, who is a friend and a teacher and just a great person to, just a great person. And her name is Yael Keller. And she's joining us this morning. Yael is in her third year of studies at Yeshivat Maharat. And formerly, she was director of operations for Yeshivat Maharat. She has a master's in public policy from the Heller School at uh, Brandeis. She worked for an organization called Uri Litzedek, uh, which is an orthodox social justice organization. And she did a lot of work um, in graduate school, working for the Joint Distribution Committee. So really a lot of work helping the vulnerable uh, through Jewish values and Jewish teachings, uh, literally across the globe. And um, she is... Uh, also a leader of a tefillah, a partnership tefillah in, is it, wait, is it partnership? Not no. partnership. All right, I apologize. Oh, <laughs> She's a leader of a, of a, of a shul, a growing shul in Philadelphia, um, where her and her husband, Rabbi Will Keller live, who was a colleague of mine, Shivat Chovitor, another very talented educator and Jewish leader. And uh, it just brings me a lot of joy to bring uh, Yael into our communal space virtually. And again, God willing, Personally, she's just a wonderful thinker and leader and doer uh, in the Jewish world. And it's a great spot to have you as our rabbinic intern this year. And she's going to be teaching a really fascinating class on uh, magic and tshuva, something which I think is really uh, both interesting and also very relevant in terms of how we think about and engage with an uncertain and crazy world. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Yael. And Yael, I... Um, we sent out a link to the sources. Could you pop that in the chat? I'm not able to do that. I just don't have it. Yes, I can. Oh. Do that. Um, 
And I'm going to. I actually, I don't have the link, but I'm happy to just share the doc into the. Great. And I'm bringing in all of our other guests. Um, so you are all now panelists. Everyone should be muted. Yeah, okay, great. that should bring you to the dock, hopefully. Okay, so everyone sees the chat. That's a link to the sources that Yale is going to use. And this is just one more thing. It's a two-part series, so we're going to be today and next Sunday, I believe, right? Is that the, is that the plan? That's my understanding, yeah. Yeah, great. So, so uh, mark your calendars for, for both dates. Uh, mm -hmm. And with that, I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to you, Yale. Thank you, Ravari. It really is a privilege to get to be an intern for Ravari and to be in your community. I hope that I can come in person, but for now, we'll have to get to know each other over Zoom. I apologize for the fancy headset. The idea is you will not hear my screaming children downstairs, so we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, thank you for welcoming me into your community. As I said, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I know that this time of year, uh oh, you cannot open the dock. Okay, let me work on that while I start. Um, let's see. Hold on. Should be anyone with the link can view. That is what it says. Is that the same? It might be the same. You know what I can do if that doesn't work? is I will just share my screen <clears throat> with everyone. Oh, it looks like some people are able to get yeah, on. Yeah, it's working for me. Just try again, it should work. Okay, okay. So I know that this time of year can feel tense for a lot of people. Um, the feeling of judgment often is overwhelming and that can be anxiety producing. And so I was thinking about how we prepare ourselves for this time of year, how we prepare um, to square our behavior from the whole year with this really intense time. And I believe that many of us do turn to what is called magical thinking. Um, and so during class today, I want to explore what magical thinking is and whether it does or doesn't fit into our Jewish way of approaching Teshuvah and approaching this time of year. And then next week, I hope that we can look at one or two of the traditions around Rosh Hashanah time that might be an example of magical thinking. Um, and why we do them or why people don't do them and how they sort of fit within our tradition. So a very quick introduction into magical thinking and its pros and cons. So the American Psychology Association defines magical thinking as a belief that an event or behavior of others can be influenced by your own thoughts, wishes, or rituals. So what does that really mean? Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm from Boston. I'm a big baseball fan. I hope that's okay. Uh, and as a teenager, I love the idea of a rally cap, um, which is when you turn your hat inside out if your team is uh, losing the game by a significant amount. And the idea is that by your turning your hat inside out and putting it back on your head, you will influence how well your team's players play and you'll make them win the game, right? So magical thinking. Um, and some people, some psychologists think that this exists because it's evolutionarily advantageous, right? By performing our superstitious ritual or making a wish or otherwise assigning belief in a power outside of ourselves and the rational world, we get a feeling that maybe the outcome of a situation isn't entirely out of our control, right? So at this time of year, I think one of the things that makes us anxious is this feeling that it's out of our control that God will do what God will do and that we have very little ability to influence. And so um, practicing magical thinking um, gives us more confidence and we suffer less anxiety. And that can be a good thing. It can help us focus and it can help us achieve our goals. It can be a tool. Um, but magical thinking has downsides as well. It can make us vulnerable. So for example, if um, you are very ill and instead of seeking medical help, you believe that um, prayer alone right, wouldn't be, be able to um, help you get better, you might um, get more sick, um, right? You have to work hand in hand with the medical system. Um, and magical thinking actually stems from early childhood. Most, most uh, young children uh, rely on magical thinking and we start to grow out of it as we get older. Um, but it's this egocentric thought, right? That if we do something, if we wear our rally caps, then we can change the outcome um, of someone else. 
Um, so now that we're all psychology experts, our crash course uh, on magical thinking, I would love if, if we can turn to the sources, um, if that's possible, um, to think about um, how uh, Judaism thinks about magical thinking. So Ravari, is it possible? Uh, oh, we're doing Rachel Stein's screen. Rachel Stein, that's so kind of you. Would it be possible to move to the tab on the source sheet? Okay. Um, or perhaps you weren't intending to share your screen with us? Was someone sharing screen? Bye -bye. Oh. No, I meant to. Is that, does everyone see it now? I thought that would help. Yeah, very helpful, thank you. Okay. Um, Wonderful. So um, I put this quote on the top because I love how it like straddles the fence so perfectly, right? The Sefer Chassidim um, says one should not believe in superstitions, but still it's best to be heedful of them, right? Like, I don't know if you should do believe in them, but they might actually be quite powerful. So you should, you should be heedful of them. So the, the place in the Torah that most uh, closely discusses what I would call magical thinking is in Devarim. We read it a few weeks ago um, as part of our Parsha reading, right? And it's, uh, the context is that when we come into Eretz Yisrael, we come into the land which Hashem gives us, that we shouldn't do um, things that are an abomination. So reading from um, uh, Pasuk Yud, right? It says, Lo bach ma'avir bino ubito ba'ish, right? You shouldn't. Um, be the type of person who does this ritual where you pass your son or daughter through fire. Um, you shouldn't be a kosein kasamim. You shouldn't use divination. You shouldn't be a mi'onein. Um, you shouldn't be a soothsayer. U minachish u mechasef, or an enchanter or a witch. And then Pasuk Yid Aleph goes on. You shouldn't be a chover chaver, a charmer, a shoel ov, or a wizard. Uh, uni, um, or a vidoresh al hametim, or a necromancer, um, asking things of the dead. I, it, you know, I don't know that word, but I know what doresh al hametim means, um, right? And the the text goes on to tell us it's to avat Hashem. It's an abomination to God to do this. So the things listed, right? Um, pass your child through fire. Um, be a, a someone who uses divination, a soothsayer, an enchanter, a witch, a charmer, a medium a wizard or someone who consults with, with uh, those who have left this world. I'm curious um, if people want to, to participate, great. If not, you could just hold a thumbs up. Do you feel like this, um, this covers magical thinking, right? Based on what we learned about what magical thinking is, would you say that this text in Zavarim is telling us we should not engage in magical thinking? So I'll be honest, um, I was very on the fence. I wasn't sure. To me, this felt like a step up for magical thinking. Some like, I was picturing like lizard's eyes in like a bubbling pot kind of magic, as opposed to rally caps and, you know, not stepping on a crack because you're worried it'll break your mother's back, right? Um, but, I, but I'm not sure. And I think that the, um, the commentators were not quite sure either. Okay, so I'm going to keep going, but if anyone wants to jump in, they're more than welcome to. Sometimes it takes a minute. Oops, I lost you to unmute yourself. So take, feel free to interrupt. Okay, so um, Rachel, if you could just scroll down a bit. Thank you so much for sharing your screen. That's so helpful. Um, wonderful. So the first um, source that we're going to look at is the Rambam. Um, right, and he's a 12th century commentator, and this is his Mishnah Torah. This is his code of law. And we're going to see that he comes down pretty obviously and clearly against magical thinking, um, right? So he says in that first source, aval ba'alei ha'chachma utmimei hadat, so right, the people who are clear thinkers, who are wise, they are going to know that the Torah is not allowing this, right? And he um, is, it's very strong, right? But he says um, on the third line, she'asra Torah, the Torah, it says this is not allowed. Inam divrei chachma, this is not wise thinking, right? This is formless nonsense. The Rambam is not pulling his punches, followed by senseless people who have abandoned truth, right? So the Rambam is clearly saying this should not be allowed. 
right? You are not uh, using your thinking brain, as my children would say, if you are thinking that magical thinking works. Um, thank you, Rachel. And then um, in the next um, piece, which is actually the piece right before, um, he gives examples that I do think really feel to me like magical thinking, and I'm sure people could think of more of them. Um, but if we go sort of to the middle, I think it's the uh, fifth line down, one, two, three, four, five, sixth line down, um, in the middle of the line, it says ho'il, right? Um, and so he's saying, someone who sees a fox coming on their right, like, which kind of reminded me of like a black cat passing your, crossing your path, right? Um, then that person will say, I won't leave my house today, right? That's like a bad sign if a fox passes by your right. say, because if I go out, you've got any Adam Rama'ai, then I will um, encounter a false person, right? Um, so the fox is a symbol of bad luck. And uh, people used to say, oh, if I see the fox, I'm not going to go out. I'm going to have a bad interaction that day, right? Or the case above, if the bread falls out of my mouth or the cane falls out of my hand, that must mean I'm not supposed to leave either, right? And so the Rambam goes on to say, kol ha'elu ha'kol asur, right? This is not allowed. The kol davar midvarim elu lo keth. So the Rambam is saying it's, it's totally uh, forbidden. It's asur. Um, because uh, he goes so far as to say that it is that we are lashed because of it. Um, so the, this fits into the Rambam sort of broader thinking about what it means um, to engage in magical thinking or or magic or to believe in miracles, right? The Rambam is like a pretty rational guy. Um, but to me, there is not a real reason here, right? Like why? Why not magical thinking? Um, why is it senseless, right? As someone who might be deeply superstitious, I would be offended by this. Um, I, I wouldn't say I necessarily am, but certainly I, I believe in some of them, and I'm sure we could think of more, right? Throwing salt over your shoulder or uh, not walking under a ladder, right? There are so many of them in our, in our world. And so this felt unnecessarily harsh to me. Why would the Rambam say it's just, just foolish? Um, so if we scroll onto the next page, um, the Sefer Achinuch, I think, gives us a, a little bit more context. It's a more gentle read in my mind. Um, and the Sefer Achinuch is a book that describes all of the mitzvot in the Torah. It was, um, it's a, an unknown author, 13th century Spain. And he actually, like the Rambam, he orders his mitzvot by Parsha. And so here we are in, in that week's Parsha a few weeks back. And I think the Sefer Achinuch elaborates more on what the danger of um, magical thinking might be. Um, and so again, we're gonna sort of jump right into the middle. Um, he also follows the Rambam saying, right, this is crazy, it's total foolishness, she got on the sikhlutz gemura. And then he gives a reason in my mind. So um, this is the fifth line down, right at the beginning of the line. It says, right? So why can't you do this? Because it might push you away from Hashem. Umi Torah to Hakadusha, and from his Torah. The Lavomi Toham Lachpira Gmurashi Hashov called to a tover at to, the whole Asheri Gruhu Shahu Divre Mikrai. Right? Because the danger is that you might think all of the good and bad that happens to you in this world um, actually is just happenstance, it's coincidental. Lo Bahashkacha Meet Boro, and it's not from the supervision of God Himself. Right? And I think that to me, this really felt like it fit into our season of thinking, right? Why should you maybe not engage in magical thinking? The danger is that egocentric behavior that we learned about in psychology. The danger is thinking that you're totally in control. And I think that that's a hard balance to strike. It reminded me of the story of a person who carries two um, notes in each pocket, right? One is that the world was created entirely for me. And the other is that I am, will return to be just dust of the earth. How do you balance? I'm in complete control of my life. I have the ability to shape what divine judgment will look like for me, but also not to go so far as to think that it's completely coincidental, right? Davar mikra'i, and it's not, um, it's not from God himself or God's self. And so I felt like the Sefer Achinuch at least gave us a reason why we should be heedful, right? Like, like that first quote on the first page. Um, there is a sort of inherent danger that we have to be watchful, we have to be mindful of, we can't let it go too far. 
Um, but on the other side of the uh, sort of classical commentary um, debate is the Ramban. And the Ramban is a, also 13th century, also Spanish um, thinker. And he, I think he sort of wants to, he's uncomfortable with saying totally out. And so he wants to widen the, the tent a little bit to say, well, the Torah says no, but really it means like a little bit yes, right? And so he says here, right, the Torah says all. Um, kol ose ela, but it doesn't say it doesn't say ose kol ela. It doesn't say that if you do all those things, because really um, he explains right. People want to know where they come from, and engage in what they consider to be pursuits of wisdom. And I think that's the flip side, right? You want to be able to um, you want to be able to know things that are out of your control because they make you feel less anxious. They make you feel more able to. Um, do things. And then also that it, this is actually a pursuit of wisdom. It's not just a silly, um, like old wives tale, but that some of magical thinking is really about searching for wisdom um, through your own actions. Um, and so he goes on in his, in his classic, um, Shailo Tuchuvot, his responsa, uh, his code of law, he says, actually, the study of astrology is not forbidden. Right, even though we learn in the Gemara that it says there's no mazal, there's no astrology for Bnei Israel, there were people who didn't share that point of view, right? The Rambam is giving us space. If you believe in magical thinking, maybe it's okay. Maybe you follow in a tradition of Chachamim who said, maybe it is okay to, um, to believe in astrology. So I think that at this point, like when we leave the, the 13th century, when we leave the classical commentaries, there is definitely space on either side of the debate um, to either practice magical thinking or feel like it's total bunk and you shouldn't practice magical thinking. Um, and I think that we will see that next Sunday when we sort of play out some of the um, traditions around Rosh Hashanah that some people do them and some people don't. And like, I really wanna give us all the freedom to say we should do what works for us. We should be, feel like we can straddle the fence on that. Um, before I go on, are there any thoughts, questions? We're about to enter a new, a new chapter. I'm just gonna take a sip of water, give people a second. Yeah, please go ahead, jump right in, David. How much of uh, Maimonides' rulings were based on his, I'll call it philosophy or theology? of a um, sort of an immutable God. And, mm -hmm. and, and what, 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 what's the relation, you know, I mean, the, what's, what's, the, what's the relationship between that? Um, I'll just leave it like that. Well, tell me what you think. Say a little more. Do you think no, that- No, I, I, don't, I don't think. That, that's my, my question. You know, all, you know, these rulings, he's, he's not just commenting on, you know, a text in Deuteronomy and, 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 and banging the gavel. You know, he's coming from his Aristotelian background, and I'm wondering how that, uh, you know, how, how, how that uh, uh, affects his thought and how that therefore might affect our own thoughts. Hmm. I have to admit, I don't know enough about Aristotelian philosophy to be able to say anything strong, but what I would say is that knowing a little bit of the Rambam from his commentary on the Torah as well, is I think this is very in line with his thinking. He is a rationalist, right? And he doesn't buy into the, the miracles and magical aspects of Judaism, right? And so I know that, for example, I heard a great Dvartar a few weeks ago about a, a midrash that like Hashem kept our clothes clean in the desert. And the Rambam comes out again swinging, like how could anyone be foolish enough to think that God is washing our clothes in the desert? Like there's no purpose in that. And so I think that... Um, for the Rambam, there's just, there's no, there's no space for this within his model of thinking, which is a much more rational approach to Judaism. I don't think I answered your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so let's go into the, the final page. And so here, I thought that this was a useful paradigm to, in which to think about magical thinking in a more modern context. So we're not going to approach prayer um, next week. I thought that we would think about tashlich and eating um, 
simanim, so the practice of throwing our sins uh, through bread into the water and then eating foods like apple and honey, where some people eat many more of them, right? Uh, fish head and black eyed uh, peas and um, squash and carrots, right? And, and so we'll explore some of those traditions. So we're not going to look at the prayer piece specifically. I think it felt like a very heavy um, and less obvious uh, example of magical thinking in today's um, time, like in this month leading up to Rosh Hashanah. But I think that it's useful to just apply some of the, um, the thoughts and to collect sort of a list of things that maybe are okay and maybe are not okay with which we can then apply those next week um, when we look at those practices. So the first, um, the first half of the page comes from a book um, called Prayer and Judaism, Continuity and Change, and it's a, it's a whole um, uh, comp compilation of essays. And the first one, uh, the one that is quoted here is from um, Professor Shalom Rosenberg, and he is thinking about prayer and Jewish thought and, and how they work together. And so he asks um, explicitly, is prayer a magical act? Right, and I think that's a that's an, a great question, Stanislaw. Before we look at his answer, right? Like, and I wonder what people think. Do you feel like when you are in the act of davening, whether it's like a quick, please God, don't let me be late to my doctor appointment when you're in traffic, or the like formal experience of sitting in shul and davening shacharit, um, does it feel like there's a magical component to that? So. I could see it either way, honestly. Um, I think prayer can be complicated, right? It's complicated when you don't get the thing you ask for. People who daven for someone who's sick and that person un, you know, passes away. People who daven for uh, a good match and they're not able to find their spouse, right? It, it, prayer is complicated. And I think that that's what Professor Rosenberg is commenting on. And so he goes um, on to say, oh, go ahead. Um, one little miss a guiding thing in Bereshit is you shall have dominion. That's what the English translation is, which makes us think that we have a lot of skill and power to uh, direct our lives, that we're dominion. And so with magical thinking or mazel, how called totally the mazel, it's very complicated. When do we have control to make good of our lives? When is it depending on Mazel? Um, it gets very complicated. Definitely. Definitely. I appreciate that sentiment because I think you picked up on so many of those, the tensions within this uh, um, idea, which are so true, right? It is, it's very complicated to think about when we should exercise our dominion and what does that even look like, right? Is dominion magical thinking? Is dominion going to Tashlich or is dominion um, going to work or going to school so that you can get a better job, right? Should you sit and daven for money or should you go and find a good job? Should you sit and daven that people should be healthy or should you go and um, you know pay visits to the sick? I think there are lots of um, layers to unwrap in this thinking, and at what point have we crossed the line, right? At what point have we stepped into God's territory, right? I have three very young children, and sometimes I say, that's not your job, that's mommy's job, right? Like, I appreciate that you took the initiative to help get your sister dressed <laughs> or whatever the thing is, but that, like, you're not equipped to do that job. And so I think that I could see that um, playing out in uh, how you were um, describing it, right? What is our dominion and what should we say we turn over to a higher power, to God, to um, for his own divine or God's own divine um, judgment? Thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you. Uh, I have one comment. Sure. Um, to go back to basic psychology, like if I go to a, to a baseball game and uh, I'm with the Cubs, and you. We have a visiting team from Boston, the Red Sox. The Red are, Sox, yeah. Half the population in that stadium is praying for their team, and the other half, or the, so obviously half will pray, and they will not be uh, satisfied. So I think, uh, depending on the level of uh, maturity with which you pray. Uh, the magic thinking that you will 
be generating will will depend mm -hmm. uh you may pray for my team to win but if my team doesn't win please god make us win next year mm -hmm. or how will i respond to the loss i mm -hmm. think response to the loss to the suffering ability to be strong could be the next level of prayer that goes along then you can say, is it a magical thinking or not magical thinking? Beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Cantor. That is also really helpful in thinking about these texts, right? What happens when there are 20 rally caps on the Red Sox and 20 rally caps on the Cubs side? Who's going to win? And, and I think what we're going to see in this question also is what does it mean? And I like the way you, you framed it. It's not that they weren't answered, right? What does it mean for your prayers to be answered? Um, does it mean you get what you want? Or does it mean maybe you get what you want next year? Um, I, don't, I don't think we think this generally in Judaism, but certainly in other uh, faith traditions, the person who is praying, sometimes they have more weight, right? If they're um, a, a priest or a, um, like a leader within the prayer community, their prayer might be listened to more. And on some level, maybe we do think that, right? We do sometimes ask a, a rabbi or a a community leader to daven for us or to keep us in mind. So, um, you know, what if there are three heavy hitting rally cap wearers on one side and 10 regular rally cap wearers on the other side? And it certainly is very complicated. And unfortunately, I, um, from my public policy background as a researcher, I like for there to be known answers. There will be no known answers at the end of this year. Um, but these are great questions. Um, and, and Rabbi Rosen, uh, Professor Rosenberg actually, I think, um, helps us pull apart some of the, the comments that we've been discussing here. Um, so he acknowledges it's extremely difficult to define the border between prayer and magic, right? And on the second line, while it is generally possible to distinguish between prayer and the use of a magic formula, it's difficult to isolate the distinction between them in principle, right? So we know that when we say abracadabra, we're talking magic. And when we say baruchat Hashem, we're talking tefillah. But he's saying, are, are we really trying to attain something so different? Or are, is our method so different? And so he draws down three distinctions. I only brought two of them that I think are most relevant to us here. So the first one is, he says that the difference between prayer and magic is inherent in a different relationship to the text of prayer. While the power and effectiveness of magic is dependent upon the correctness of the formula and its precise ex execution, that is the words or actions, the main element of prayer is the human intention involved. Right, and so there, I, I again, I sort of sit on both sides of this. I, I see what he's saying, right? If you mispronounce a word in Shachrit, uh, if you are still davening with your full heart, um, we believe, I think, that that, that prayer is accepted. Whereas if you're having some kind of magical incantation, then your precise pronunciation and actions seem much more important. Um, it reminded me a little bit at this time of year of the story of um, the little boy who goes to shul and doesn't know how to dab in, but he brings his flute, right? And he plays a, a, a note of his flute and it stills the community because you can't bring a musical instrument on Yom Kippur to shul. And the rabbi says, no, this boy's uh, tefillah was so pure of heart and so intentional. His tefillah was better than all the words, right, that we said. And so I think that's the approach, but I see, uh, I see someone shaking their head. I'm sorry, I don't know everyone's name here yet. Do you want to share your, your wishy-washy feeling? You're not buying it? <laughs> okay, if you change your mind, let us know. Um, so I think that's a possible distinction right, is that when you go to Tashlich, there are words to say, but maybe it doesn't really matter what the, the words are. When you go, when you show up at davening, you could sit in davening with your seat door open and your eyes closed, and you could have a, a, a really um, honest, important plea, go up to Shemayim, go up to God, without it being exactly the words of the text as they are stated. We have a text but that's not what, it, uh, its proper pronunciation is not what, uh, what um, gives us the power behind it. And then his second answer um, is that magic operates automatically while prayer is not necessarily answered. And I think this is what Mr. Nelson, I think that was, that was who it was, Mr. Cantor, I apologize, um, was, was alluding to, right? Is how do we know when our prayer is answered? And so, 
uh, Professor Rosenberg suggests that the will of God is the bridge between prayer and its answer. And this will is not subject to any casual causal law. The pseudoscientific approach, which ca characterizes magic, is transformed in prayer into a pseudo-personal one. Right? We're no longer expecting that when we throw this thing and that thing in the pot, that like the poof of magic comes out. We now know that there's a, um, it's meant to form a connection between us and, and God. And so of these two approaches, the former typifies the stance of medieval Jewish thought, while the latter is that of Jewish thought in more recent generations. So right back when the Rambam and the Ramban were around, there was maybe a more flexible thinking that when you daven, that there was like something that would magically happen at the end. If you daven for help, you will get help or you won't, but then your prayer was unanswered. Whereas I think today we think more like Mr. Cantor that it, sometimes we pray for something and it's not that God doesn't answer or it's not that God says no, but it, the result is not the one that we had wanted. And that can be a tough tension to bring into the Yamim Tovim. Um, to say, we're going to sit in shul all day or a very small part of the day to be safe this year, right? On Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and daven and daven and pour our hearts out and not worry about the words, but about our intentions. And we might not get what we want. And so for Professor Rosenberg, that is what distinguishes magical thinking from Jewish tefillah. I don't know how that resonates for people. But I found it to be, I found it to feel true to my own way of approaching to be laugh. So we'll go to the last uh, paragraph on the page and then maybe we can open back up for, for conversation, which was so great before. Um, this book is not a Jewish book. Um, it's a, a book called Prayer, A History, um, but it is a, there's a multi-faith aspect. And I, I think that here, this um, helps us think about the distinctions between magical thought and prayer. And so the way that Philip Zaleski um, describes um, these two acts, right, are there are two figures that stand guard at the threshold of prayer, two ways to approach it, the magician and the priest, like the Kohen, right? So the magician commands and the priest offers. So already I think that we're in a different space, right? The, when we um, bring our tefillot, we are offering them. They're bakashot, they're requests. They're not, you, God, you must do this if I do that, um, right? The, the prayer of the magician is an incantation, a charm, a chanted or inscribed word or power used to achieve a particular end, to heal the sick, revive the dead, send rain, open the womb and defeat an enemy and so on. Right, and here I, I thought of yet another story um, where it felt like sometimes this was in the Jewish tradition, especially as, as Professor Rosenberg said in, in medieval uh, Jewish thought. Right, so in, in the Gemara, there's a story some people might be familiar with of a man named Choni. And Choni um, is known as Choni Hama'agel, Choni who stands in a circle. And what happens is that there's no rain and people engaged in tefillah in the way we would think of it today, right? That they davened for rain, they asked God to send rain. And Choni got fed up and he went into the middle of town and he stood on the dirt, like the, the packed ground, and he drew with a stick, a circle around him. And he said, God, I am not leaving the circle until you send rain. And to me, that sounds like almost exactly what the prayer of the magician is, right? He said, I will stand here until there is rain. And maybe that was just an expression of faith, but to me, it sounds like that command, that command to achieve a particular end, to stand in a circle until there is rain so that the, they don't go hungry that year. So I don't know. I don't know what to do with that piece. I guess I would just say again, I, I do think our tradition is very rich and varied and that there's no one answer on magical thinking here. Um, but to go on, the prayer of the priest is an invocation. It's a spoken or sung portion of a sacrifice, which by honoring the gods, or God in our case, attains both temporal and eternal goods. And again, that to me, that does resonate with what we do when we're in shul, right? We go to shul, we sing, we talk, we honor Hashem, we give him shabbat, we give him praise, we ask him for things, we give him bakashot, uh, God, and then um, we hope that we will attain temporal and eternal goods, right? Both um, health on this earth when we're here and we're blessed to be here, and also that we should, um, you know, go to olam haba, go up to shamayim when we are done being on this earth. 
Magical prayer draws down power from the heavens. Priestly prayer pours itself out on the altar stone and ascends to the heaven in fragrant smoke. Right? And again, I did, you know, if you think of like movies with sorcerers in them, like there is this element of bringing the lightning down into the, the pot. Um, whereas if you think about Carbonote, right, when we talk about the smoke going up to God, the directionality of magical thinking and prayer are a little bit different, right? If you think of that um, sentiment of a uh, step on a crack, break your mother's back, right? You're demanding something. You're saying, if I don't step on the crack, then you can't allow bad health to fall upon my mother, right? And I don't think anyone really means it that way necessarily uh, in today's context, but I think that that's, that is like a weakened version of magical thinking. Whereas tefillah, or perhaps some of the things that we do over the yamim tovim, yamim naraim, are much more um, a, a way to offer prayer to ascend up to, to God um, in our, our own reach nichach, our own fragrant smoke. Um, and so uh, Zaleski says, these are the archetypal actions. They belong not only to prayers ancestral past, but also to its present and its future. Meaning we might think that the magical piece of it is like a, you know, silly part of the way that people used to think about davening, but really it's part of our present and it will be a part of our future. And so these, these two texts for me were a good example where we could pull apart um, Jewish ritual from magic ritual um, to think about how we would, um, identify what makes something magical or um, Jewish or spiritual or prayer oriented um, instead. So again, next week we'll look sort of more into the details of Tashlich um, and um, the Simanim. Another option is to think about, um, as my grandfather would have said, shlach kaparo, to, you know, to wave the, the chicken. Um, if anyone has any other ideas, I'm happy to brainstorm a little bit right now. I would love to throw them into um, the source sheet for next week, because I think that that will just make it a, a more lively and interesting conversation. So the ones that I have thought of, again, were tashlich, um, eating apples and honey and other sort of lucky foods, um, perhaps waving a chicken um, around your head, uh, if you're inclined. Um, and if anyone has any other ideas, I'd love to hear them or any other thoughts push back against the idea of magical thinking and prayer. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I have one more thought if I can say it. Um, we we usually use the idea of Hana that her prayer was answered. Mm -hmm. So when we daven, most of us hope that our that Hana will be the way that we will be answered. And we don't like to think about the fact it might be answered next time or Malay Michelle Oseno Latova that maybe our our wish is not completely right. But that's such a wonderful thing, the story of Hannah, that gives us hope that we will be answered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, so just thinking about that it may not be answered or might be answered at a later date is not really very pleasant, to be honest. <laughs> yes. Yes, and I think that that goes to our feeling of, of hopelessness, right? We don't want to think it'll be answered at a later date. We want it to be answered now when we feel like we need the thing we're asking for, 100%. Okay, thank you. Sure. Oh, you're, you're on mute, Mr. Cantor. Sorry. That's okay. One one more comment. I think we, ex we exert magical thinking, even without wanting to. Every time, for instance, when we go see a doctor, he gives us a prescription for a pain medicine. Some of the component of the pain medicine effect is magic. It's called the placebo effect. It's well known, mm -hmm. it's scientific, it's mm -hmm. documenting brain waves and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we walk out from the doctor's office, uh, there is the effect of the doctor, the magic effect, the pharmacological effect of the drug. So the same thing if you are praying and you don't step on a crack and you come home and your mother's back is intact, I think that gives us a special pleasurable feeling to a child saying, gee, how powerful I am. Thank God. If you coordinate that with God's effect, God's priority, primacy, I think it uh, should be comparable to 
to prayer as opposed to just praying to some idol or some uh, some other deity that not Hashem. So mm -hmm. I think that makes a difference in acceptable magical thinking and non-acceptable magical thinking. Beautiful. So if you if you do it because you want to affect change, but you ascribe the ultimate success to God, it, it's a partnership. I like that. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Al. This was really thought-provoking and I think really challenges us to think about what am I doing when I do these things and what am I hoping for? And these are good things to be thinking about this time of year. Um, so we look forward to continuing our learning with you next week. Thanks everyone for joining for the great thoughts. This is a really great and very thoughtful group. Uh, and God willing, we'll continue together a week from now. Thank you, Yael. Wonderful to see you. Have a great rest of the day. Thank and you. Uh, everybody, tonight at 7 p.m., uh, the new launch continues. Tonight at 7 p.m., reminder, we have our class led by Rabbi Belinsky on how to daven at home. So for those who are thinking about not coming to services, for everyone, it's a great class because it's really gets to, you know, just personal prayer in general, but especially for those who aren't going to be attending a holiday service this year or may not, or even who aren't coming to regular Shabbat services, it's a wonderful way to learn about how to approach what can feel like an overwhelming amount of liturgy, so many pages and so much, and what do I do, and just like overwhelming. He's going to really break it down uh, from a halachic perspective, what's essential, what's not, and also from a kind of conceptual spiritual perspective, like what are these the different sections do and how do we relate to them? And I hope it'll be very helpful. So that's tonight at 7 p.m. And uh, have a great have a great Labor Day weekend, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.